Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Thursday, December 21st edition of the Basement Academy. I want to offer an Advent reflection today, in appropriate to the season of Advent that we have been in for the last of four weeks, and is drawing to a close this Sunday uh, as we uh, prepare for Christ's birth. But I want to offer an Advent reflection using the words of the book of Revelation in this 22nd chapter. Uh, but first I want to read from the psalm. Psalm 81. It, it's a little longish, but it's a, it's a gentle reminder, gentle call, maybe even reproof that we are called to listen to God. And, and we have some similar language here about blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy. And so Psalm 81. Sing for joy to God our strength. Shout aloud to the God of Jacob. Begin the music. Strike the tambourine. Play the melodious harp and lyre. Sound the ram's horn at the new moon and when the moon is full on the day of our feast. This is a decree for Israel, an ordinance of the God of Jacob. He established it as a statute for Joseph when he went out against Egypt where we heard a language we did not understand. He says, I removed the burden from their shoulders and their hands were set free from the basket. In your distress, you called and I rescued you. I answered you out of a thundercloud. I tested you with the waters of Meribah. Hear, O oh my people, and I will warn you. If you would but listen to me, O oh Israel. You shall have no foreign God among you. You shall not bow down to an alien God. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. Open wide your mouth and I will fill it. But my people would not listen to me. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own devices. If my people would but listen to me, if Israel would follow my ways, how quickly would I subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe before him and their punishment would last forever. But you would be fed with the finest of wheat. With honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. Mm, Psalm 81. A pleading, the psalmist pleading, God pleading through the psalmist. Listen to me. Come, worship me and worship me alone. And so there's some, I think, some similarities to what we uh, what we have uh, here in the, the book of Revelation, this call to, to listen. In fact, I was reading in the um, a book of Hebrews this morning, just in my own journey through uh, reading the, the Bible in a year, uh, wrapping up. And the translation I, I'm reading out of in, in Hebrews 5 talks about, by now you should be teachers, but you've picked up this bad habit of not listening to me. And I wonder... You know, Hebrews is written centuries after the psalmist, but, but in, in centuries later, here we are. People have a, just, we have a bad habit of not listening well to the word of God, not listening to God. He wants, <laughs> he wants us to be fed with that finest of wheat. He, he wants us to, to enjoy that sweet honey from the rock. And so may God give us ears to hear his word today. Okay. We're going to look at the last words. And so chapter 13 of, of Eugene Peterson's book, I encourage you to, to read that. And so I'm going to read in just a moment the last uh, few paragraphs, last you know, 14, 15 verses of, of the book of Revelation, which are the last words in our Bible, the last words of Scripture written. And we're going to read. And so you know, we often pay attention to last words, don't we? And three times we're going to hear this refrain, Behold, I am coming soon. In verse 7, verse 12, and, and verse 20. And this language about the time being near. So I want to reflect on you with this, this notion of time and the, the, the return of our, our, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, and so this is the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verses 7 through 21, which really are the epilogue. 
serving as a bookend to the opening few verses. In, in chapter 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. That word soon. We're going to hear that word soon in just a moment. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is he, blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. So that, we read that weeks ago. Now, 22 verse 7. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I had heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said to me, do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers, the prophets, and of all who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Then he told me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, because the time is near. Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who was vile continue to be vile. Let him who does right continue to do right. And let him who is holy continue to be holy. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Mm. What, a, what a reading, huh? And so there's this language about don't take away or add to the, the, the words of this prophecy, that the language of prophecy has been woven throughout. And, and this is a warning to me. I, I have spoken and I, 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 God, may I not have added to nor taken away from this book of prophecy. We often get confused with the, the word prophecy and understanding what it means. We hear the, the phrase, the time is near, and this is a book of prophecy. So we assume that this is all about predicting the future, foretelling events that are going to happen in the future. And there is a predictive aspect to prophecy. There is. The virgin will be with child. <laughs> Isaiah prophesies about the birth of Jesus Christ. But the base, deeper, the, the, the broader, more basic and, and, and deeper meaning of prophecy is not foretelling the future. It's forth telling the word of God in the present. It is a telling forth the truth of God in the present moment. And so the angel gave to John this testimony for the churches. For the seven churches at that moment, <laughs> these words were given. Not to be speculating about the future, thousands and thousands of years hence, 
but for encouragement and for strength and for hope and for warning to not turn away from your faith under pressure, right? And so the, the psalmist is, that's the spirit of prophecy. Warn, I am warning you, Israel, listen to me. Come worship me alone. Eric and I, when we stand up and read the scripture and, and, and preach on Sunday, that's the spirit of prophecy. We're taking the word of God and trying to apply it in this moment. But what do we do with this language then of time? The time is near. Behold, I am coming soon. And so what do we do with that? In the Greek language, there are two words for time, chronos and kairos. Chronos sounds familiar to us, chronology. It, it's the duration of time. It's the tick-tock, tick-tock. It's the clock. It's the calendar. It's the chronology. It's the sequence of events. And so often prophecy gets concerned with chronology. It gets, con it gets concerned with what's going to happen out there. But there's another word for time, the Greek word for time, kairos. And it has to do with a moment in time that is pregnant with opportunity, is full of opportunity. There's an invitation. It is the turning point in time. And so uh, the invasion of Normandy, that happened in chronology, but it was the turning point of World War II. And so... Kairos and Kronos working together. We, we can't avoid the ticking of the clock, right? John wrote this, gave this. He encountered the angel in Kronos. In chronology, there was a point in time when he was on an island of Patmos uh, for his faith. He was being persecuted for his faith when Kairos broke out, a, 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 a moment of opportunity. And so when we read here, the time is near, it's Kairos. It's not Kronos. It's not the time, the, chron the Kronos is near. The Kairos, the, the opportune moment is here. This pregnant moment, this invitation, this turning point is available to you. And so that's why uh, he says, uh, uh, if anyone, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm missing it right here. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. Whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. That's the Kairos moment. The book of Revelation is a call to be reconciled with Christ. It is a call to trust Jesus Christ. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is a call to embrace him who is the bright morning star, who is the root and offspring of David, the lamb who was slain, the lion of the tribe of Judah who has triumphed. This is a, a call to trust God and trust Jesus. That's the time is near. Kairos is upon us. And so every time we read the book of Revelation, we are not to be concerned with speculation and the future and when are these things going to happen. It is an invitation to accept Christ and believe Christ and trust Christ and recommit ourselves to Christ and to live for Christ in this moment. And so Kairos bids a sense of urgency. Get right with God today. Come to him now. <laughs> This sense of urgency, behold, I'm coming soon. Now, we don't know when he will return. Jesus told us back in the book of Acts, in the book of Matthew, we read that the other day. Only the Father knows when in Kronos the Son will return, but every day is Kairos. Every day is Armageddon. Every day there's a battle. Whether we're going to submit to the beast and take the mark of the beast and only be about buying and selling and only about securing things for ourselves and getting uh, ours so we can get ahead, or, or are we going to let the, the, the lamb who was slain mark us with his blood and in our waters of baptism claim our baptismal identity as the people of God and resist the beast and live for the kingdom of God? And so every day is Kairos. And so it's urgency versus hurry. If we find ourselves getting anxious and hurried, we, we've lost a sense of kairos. In our hurry, in our anxiety, we, we, we swift our way past neighbors who 
whom God has placed in our lives that we might love them, that we might serve them, that we might pay attention. So Kairos pays attention. Kronos becomes anxiety. Kairos lives with a sense of urgency. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And, 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 and Kronos says, no, 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 I don't have time to go to church. I've got too much to do. And so this Kairos, Kronos thing, Revelation is a book of Kairos, <laughs> not Kronos. And so Peterson in, in this, uh, this final chapter, when he talks about John falling at the feet of the angel to worship the angels, like, no, 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 worship God. I, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more tomorrow. Worship God. And, and so Peterson writes on page 187, And so people get interested in everything in this book except God. Losing themselves in symbol hunting, intrigue with numbers, speculating with frenzied imaginations on times and seasons. Mm. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, not the end of the world, not the identity of Antichrist, not the timetable of history. It's the, the, the key is understanding this kairos, this, this understanding. And why the biblical interpretators over the centuries have missed this is a mystery to me. That this book is not about predicting the future. It's about calling everyone who reads this book of the prophecy in the moment that they are reading it to hear it and to take it to heart. The kairos moment is here. That's the moment that is near. <laughs> And so, behold, I'm coming soon. This moment could be the moment of encounter with Jesus Christ if we but open our hearts and, and receive him and take to heart this call. So, the Advent message. I, I said I was going to have this be an Advent reflection. Advent, we're in the season of Advent. It's the four-week season that leads up to the 12-day celebration of Christ's birth. So technically, it's not the Christmas season. It's the Advent season. Advent is a word. It's based on a Latin word that means coming or arrival. And so we rightly pay attention to the coming of Jesus Christ, his first Advent or his first coming. And so we read the prophets, Isaiah and Micah and others who, who look forward to the coming of Christ. And we see that fulfilled in his birth. So the coming of Messiah. That rightly is part of this Advent cycle. But also we look forward to the Kronos moment when he will come again. He will come again. And so we live with attention and with urgency. We live the Kairos. This is the day the Lord has made. He may come back this day. So let me be found about his business. Loving my neighbor well. <laughs> saying my prayers and, and seeking to be faithful as a disciple of Jesus Christ, to put into practice all the things that he told us, the Great Commission, right? And, and so Advent living is, is living eschatologically. Now, I, I, I've kind of saved this for the end. Eschatology is a fancy word. It's a theology word. It's, it's part of the broader theological discipline of how do we understand the world God has made. And eschatology is concerned with the eschaton. That's the Greek word for last or end. So eschatology is concerned with the last things. And so looking to the future about the return of Christ, that's eschatology. People who talk about the, the millennial views, the premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial views, that's eschatology. The rapture, whether or not the rapture will happen, when the rapture will happen, what does it mean? All of those things, that's eschatology, right? And so Peterson writes all the way back in the first chapter, page nine, it is generally agreed that the revelation has to do with eschatology, that is, with last things. What is frequently missed is that all the eschatology is put to immediate pastoral use. Eschatology is the most pastoral of all the theological perspectives, showing how the ending 
impinges on the present in such ways that the truth of the gospel is verified in life in the middle. We're in the middle of the story. This story is still going on. The story of God's good creation and the tragic fall and the promises to Abraham and the prophetic utterances of Messiah coming and Messiah coming and his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his giving the spirit, the birthing of the church. We're now living that story. So there is yet story ahead of us. So we're in the middle of God's story of redemption and we're in the middle of the story of our own lives. Each of us will, if Christ does not return before we die, then we will die and then go to be with him. He will not come back to us, as it were. And so Peterson bids us to consider living eschatologically. And, he, and he, he rightly understands that what John is talking about, the time, the kairos is near. This moment, he's writing to the churches who are presently faced with hardship. And every generation of Christians is faced with hardship. Every generation has to deal with the beast. Every generation faces a daily Armageddon. Are we gonna are we gonna submit to the beast or are we gonna submit to the to, to the proper uh, king of the universe? And so Peterson recognized and he, this this eschatological living. When we know the end of the story, we know that the rider on the white horse goes forth and he triumphs. And we know how he triumphs. He's already triumphed. He's triumphed over the grave. Jesus is victorious. And so the rider who goes forth to conquer with his army and, and does away with that beast and does away with that dragon and throws them into the lake of fire. And then that heavenly city comes down out of heaven, what we just read the other day. <laughs> And there is no more death. There's no more pain. There's no more sorrow. Every tear will be wiped away. There will not even be a sun because the, the Lord and the, lamb, and the Lamb will be the light of that city. And we can take from the tree of life on either side of the river of life. And we can drink from that water of life. And the leaves of that tree are for the healing of the nations, the restoration of all things, all that burdens us, all that we ache. The curse will be no more. We talked about that, what, on Tuesday, right? When we understand that, we live today with greater confidence, with greater hope, with greater assurance. I don't like the way this thing's unfolding. I'm concerned about you know, politics in America. I'm concerned about geopolitical things in the nations. I'm concerned about my own grief, the loss of a loved one, or the memory of the loss of a loved one, or my aching body, or my, uh, my, my too low bank account. Whatever it is that plagues us and ails us and troubles us, if we hear the words of the prophecy, if we listen, if we but listen and take the words to heart, we are strengthened. We, we have confidence. We believe. And we're able to worship God. We don't, we're not anxious about our world. We give attention to God and we make Sunday worship and daily worship and daily living, faithful living a priority because we know that God has the end secure for us. So let us live as Advent Christians, not just four weeks a year, but every day of the year, live with a sense of the Advent. His first coming gives me assurance that his second coming will happen as well. And so I live towards that good and glorious end, the chief end to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So I end with actually words of Stephen Covey. <laughs> Some of you may remember that book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Oh, golly, probably goes back into the 80s, right? Maybe, maybe early 90s. Mm. And the seven habits of highly effective people, Covey traces out different practices and disciplines that people who live well do. And the first is this, begin with the end in mind. And he gives us a little thought exercise in the book. And he says, imagine your own funeral. And, and there are people who stand to speak, someone from your family, someone from your faith community, someone from your work, someone from your, your broader community. What do you want them to say about you? 
What are the kinds of words you would want them to deliver in, in a eulogy at your funeral? And he says, go live towards that end, that vision. That is your end. Live towards that. Become the kind of person. Have an understanding. Every day when you get up, act and, and speak, <laughs> behave so that you become the kind of person that is spoken the way you want to be spoken of. So it's a thought exercise. And so that's a personal way of living eschatologically. Contemplate your own end, the end of your own life. Now, what the book of Revelation does, it takes it, live towards this end, the free gift of life that is given us, that, that, that we have. Live towards this glorious gospel. Live towards this reunion. Live towards this celebration. Live towards this life that God has for us in Jesus Christ that is clearly revealed in these words. So anyway, let us be Advent Christians all year round. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Lord, be pleased to give us ears to hear the words of this prophecy and to live them well and to live towards this good and chief and glorious end. And so help us to do this now. Help us to do this every day. As we pray in the name of the Savior, who is revealed here in these scriptures, even as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And to use the words of Revelation 22, verse 21, the last words in the Bible, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. <laughs>